Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Uh, bienvenue à la Comité des finances et de développement économique pour la Ville d'Ottawa pour le 12 février uh, 2019. Welcome to Ottawa City Council. Uh, for those uh, uh, members of the public who like to speak on an item that's uh, on the agenda, if they could fill out a form under the sign. Uh, just have a, a quick announcement with respect to the uh, impending uh, snowstorm. <coughs> Because of the storm we're expecting this afternoon, I've decided to cancel tomorrow's City Council meeting. Uh, I invite all employees uh, at the City, as well as uh, with other employers in the City, to make arrangements with their manager should they be able to work from home tomorrow. This will alleviate uh, traffic and make life easier for our snow clearing crews who will already be faced with significant challenges throughout the day, today and tomorrow. En raison de la tempête entendue cet après-midi, j'ai décidé d'annuler la rencontre conseil municipal de demain. J'invite tous les employés de la ville et au sein d'autres employés à discuter avec leurs gestionnaires pour voir s'ils peuvent travailler de la maison demain. Ceci rendra la tâche plus facile à nos équipes de neigement qui sont déjà débordées. And so I want to thank our uh, city staff. As you know, we've had uh, record amounts of snowfall and record amounts of rain. It's been very, very challenging and difficult for uh, all uh, residents, uh, but in particular, our crews have been working uh, literally around the clock, uh, grinding and scraping and uh, removing snow banks just to see them come back a day or two later. So uh, I, I think I, all members of council uh, would join me in thanking uh, those men and women who are out doing a very challenging uh, job in this uh, climate that we live in. And uh, we know that the next uh, 48 hours are going to be quite a challenge, so we encourage uh, people who are able to, uh, if they have the permission of their appropriate managers, to see if they can work from home to reduce the number of vehicles uh, on uh, streets today. Alors, déclaration d'intérêt, déclarations of interest. Yeah. Uh, confirmation of minutes, adoption de process verbeux, uh, minutes 41, le 14 novembre 2019. Carried. Okay. Presentation, we have a presentation on the uh, LRT, and we'll come to that in just a moment. Uh, Office of the City Clerk and Solicitor, Bureau du Greffier Municipal de l'Avocat, Service Legislative, uh, number two, FEDCO Terms of Reference. Is it a quick item, Councillor? Councillor McKenney has a question. Uh, are they technical or should we come, we'll come back to it then? Sure. Okay. Sure. Item three, city representation and delegate attending the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and Association of Municipalities of Ontario. Okay. Carried. Item four, status update, FEDCO committee inquiries and motions for the period ending the 25th of January. Rapport de situation, uh, sur terminal le 25 janvier 2019. Received. Received. Um, Item 5, appointments to the Shaw Center Board of Directors, nomination au Centre Shaw, Conseil d'administration. Okay. Carried. Okay. Item 6, uh, appointment to the French Language uh, Services Committee. Uh, Conseiller uh, uh, Cloutier, uh, est-ce que tu acceptes cette uh, recommandation de Conseiller Tierney? Uh, la motion que, je ne sais pas si on va la lire, mais oui, absolument. Oui, right. absolument. So, Councillor Tierney, uh, you're moving, do you want to just read the... Therefore, be it resolved. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Therefore, be resolved that the Finance and Economic Development Committee appoint Councillor Jean Cloutier to serve as a liaison member for the 2018 to 2022 term of council. Merci. Adopté. Okay. On the appointments as presented, carried. Uh, amendments to the Barhaven BIA Board of Management, Wellington West BIA, and Cartier Vanier uh, BIA. Okay. Carried. Item 8, Business Improvement Area Boards of Management Appointments 2018 to 2022 Term of Council, Conseil d'Amination des Zones d'Amélioration Commerciale Nomination 2018 à 2022. Carried. And then we're back to item number 1. Okay, so uh, Mr. Manconi, uh, you were uh, up and uh, uh, Mr. Peter Louch, CEO uh, of um, RTG, is also uh, with us, and Mr. Manconi and his team are doing the presentation, and I believe we have them up on the screen as well.
Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of committee. Uh, joining me today uh, on my right is Michael Morgan, who I announced uh, earlier this year. He's uh, the director of light rail construction for stage one and will also be the uh, director of uh, construction for stage two. Uh, he works and reports directly to me. He's got a wealth of knowledge and experience on testing and commissioning uh, rail systems, vehicles, and uh, has worked both in the uh, private sector side and now in the public sector. To my left is uh, Mr. Peter Lausch. Uh, he is the CEO of RTG, uh, so the entire project uh, reports through to him and to his executive committee. He is also um, uh, part of RTM, the Rideau Transit Maintenance Group, which is the group that has the 30-year concession period. So Mr. Lausch has a vested interest in, uh, in seeing the successful uh, build of this project and getting to revenue service. So Mr. Mayor, I want to start off uh, today with, uh, we have another element of Ready for Rail, which is our campaign for our customers to uh, familiarize themselves with the system. You're going to go, uh, I'm going to show you a short video. Uh, this is part of a larger uh, initiative. It's um, an interactive 360 video that you can navigate the station, uh, Lion Station in this case. We'll also have this for the vehicle. Um, and it's going to demonstrate uh, the great work and the great uh, design of the station and uh, the excellent work that uh, RTG has done to date uh, on the uh, civil side of uh, building these, this infrastructure. Welcome to our demonstration of the 360 degree virtual tour of the Confederation Lines Lion Station. We start at street level, the Queen Street entrance by Place de Ville. Customers can take the stairs to reach the train or use one of the elevators. This tour lets us take a virtual elevator. Ici, nous sommes au niveau 3, au bas des escaliers et des escaliers roulants qu'on peut voir en haut. Les escaliers roulants fonctionnent en continu pour faire monter les usagers vers le niveau supérieur. Le niveau où nous nous trouvons est relié au complexe de la place de ville. Maintenant, nous allons suivre les panneaux d'orientation pour nous rendre au niveau 2, le hall. Here, we find the ticket machines where customers can buy, load or check the balance on a presto card, buy a one-day or multi-day pass and buy a single ride ticket. The machines include a video chat help feature that allows customers to connect with an OC Transpo customer service representative live on screen. These are the fare gates where customers tap their Presto card, smart card or multi-day pass. They can also scan the barcode on a ticket or one day pass to enter. Accessible fare gates are wider and they have an additional smart card reader at an accessible height. They are labeled and can be found by following the tactile wayfinding strips on the floor. Après les portillons se trouve la zone de tarification contrôlée dans le hall. Allons maintenant sur le quai. Remarquez que les escaliers de l'ensemble de la station sont équipés de rampes d'accès sur lesquelles les usagers peuvent faire rouler leur vélo pour la montée et la descente des escaliers. Et nous voici sur le quai, la zone qui longe les voies où les passagers montent dans l'eau train et en descendent. The platform includes a trans-secure waiting area with closed-circuit TV cameras, enhanced lighting and emergency phones. The wires that supply electricity to the trains are known as the overhead cantonary system. Fencing will be removed prior to opening to the public. The platforms include warning strips and intercar barriers to keep customers safely away from the platform edge. Let's head back up to the concourse. And now we'll head over to the Lion Street access, which is two levels up. Nous allons prendre l'ascenseur virtuel encore une fois. Et nous voici à l'entrée qui donne sur la rue Lion. Merci de vous être joint à nous pour cette visite virtuelle de la station Lion de la ligne de la Confédération sur la ligne 1 de l'Autrain. Welcome to our demonstration of the 360 degree so, Mr. Mayor, next I want to take you through the uh, update of the stations uh, east, uh, heading in a westerly direction. Uh, the stations, as you can tell from the exterior and that interior view, are uh, virtually complete. Um, RTG is um, doing their last piece of uh, certification and paperwork necessary to get what's called uh, final occupancy 
permits. So as you move uh, from east to west, you can see uh, the stations are complete, not only from the exterior, but also when you look uh, interior, uh, all the finishes, signage, wayfinding, all the customer facing elements that we've talked about in the past are complete. And it's certainly uh, a great indication of uh, the great work that's been done in terms of these stations, which I uh, continue to believe are best in class in terms of LRT systems around the world. That's U Ottawa station. Uh, and then down below, again, uh, Fairgate, signage um, and all the finishing touches that have been completed. Um, I want to pause here, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you'll recall back in September we had serious concerns about the work that was outstanding, the civil work that was outstanding at Rideau Station. I, I do have to give RTG credit where credit is due. Uh, literally hundreds of uh, personnel in this station representing thousands of uh, labor hours. That was your station back in September. Uh, this is Rideau Station today. Uh, same view, uh, that glass in the back is the artistic integrated art with etched glass. Um, the finishes are uh, all done. Uh, there's some minor testing and commissioning uh, works underway. Uh, but again, uh, they've done a phenomenal job of uh, accelerating the uh, civil work that needed to be done in this station. So Rideau Station is also complete. Parliament, same thing, uh, an example of some of the finishes and wayfinding. Uh, integrated art, uh, that's an intertrack barrier uh, where uh, you, rather than just having boring metal there, there's uh, some great artwork that's been done with our art lo artists and our uh, arts groups. And then Parliament Station. Parliament Station is complete. Uh, this is that uh, outstanding artistic roof that uh, you are getting. Uh, it will be, um, I'm sure there'll be millions of photographers taking pictures of this, tourists, welcoming tourists to our city, and also our uh, everyday customers. So Parliament is complete. There are a bunch of technicians installing this uh, intricate uh, ceiling art uh, where no piece is like the other one. So it's, uh, it's a great uh, initiative and it will make that station uh, certainly iconic. Lion Station, as you saw, is complete um, and uh, ready for, uh, for future use. Pimacy Station, same thing, uh, positioned well. And Tunney's Pasture, um, also uh, in a very good complete state. So with respect to the civil work and the stations, uh, the key push is for RTG to get occupancy uh, permits. I want to thank Frank Bedin, Mr. Willis, and the building inspectors team, John Buck. They're doing a phenomenal job of helping RTG get that final push to get uh, all the necessary letters and documentation and to get final occupancy so that we can then go in as OC Transport and get familiar with the stations and start to uh, operationalize them. I also, you know, today in today's newspaper, Mr. Willing did an article, and I want to thank him for drawing the attention to the great work that our inspectors are doing. Uh, they're doing their due diligence. They're finding out uh, areas that needed to be addressed, and Mr. Morgan has eight full-time inspectors out there. And I remind everyone, this is the largest civil project in the history of Ottawa, and finding uh, issues that need corrective action uh, and corrective measures is part of any construction project, whether you're renovating your kitchen, building a house or a building, this is day-to-day -day normal practice, and heaven forbid if we had a $2.1 billion project with no issues or no deficiencies. So, um, it, uh, you know, someone asked me if I'm concerned about that. Not one bit. The inspectors are doing their job, the uh, building inspection team is doing their job, and RTG is doing their job in addressing those issues. And then also a, an important reminder is that they have a 30-year concession period that they're heavily penalized if things don't go well. So it's in their best interest for um, RTG and RTM to build that infrastructure accordingly. So um, the elements that are being tracked, and uh, this is critical. This is an important part of the presentation. There is total congruency and alignment with RTG, the Executive Committee, and the City of Ottawa. Believe it or not, we're down to eight things to complete this $2.1 billion state-of-the-art LRT project. Um, and some of these you've heard me talk about in the past. The first uh, is very, very important. You, ha you need your fleet. Uh, we need 15 double vehicles uh, running from end to end to provide our peak hour service. And then there's four single vehicles that are needed for spares and for uh, swap out in the event that there's issues with any vehicles. Uh, and RTG and Alstom have some work to do in that regard to get that fleet availability count uh, where it needs to be. 
Station occupancy, I think that's imminent. Um, um, Mr. Lausch and his team have been working with building services, and we think that uh, we'll get station occupancy very soon, certainly in the east, and then head in a westerly direction. The tunnel ventilation system, I'm gonna show you some photos of that in a moment. These are very critical uh, life-saving systems in the event of smoke or fire in the tunnel. Uh, they control the flow of movement of air, smoke, uh, and uh, need to be operated in, uh, in any emergency situation. So there's rigorous testing. There's three critical elements that we've asked RTG to, uh, to complete, and they're working on that to provide us that information. The testing of the train control system, the TALUS CBTC system that I talked about in the past, it's progressing very, very well. There are some final uh, tests and protocols that need to be signed off on by TALUS and by, uh, by RTG, and then uh, that completes that part of the regime. So there's progress on that front. Um, the SCADA, that's the operations and monitoring and control system that's fed into our control room. Some of you have been in our control room. That's so our operators can see the trains, can see the fans, can see the, uh, all the customer facing elements and can make adjustments on the fly as they need to to provide that integrated uh, mobility to bus and paratranspo and, uh, and the diesel train system. Um, the final test of the power system, that's the overhead catenary system that drives power to the trains, to the lights, to the stations and so forth. There's some final checks and balances that RTG is doing there. Um, and then number seven is very, very important. This is the one that you know, will make us all sleep well at night, and that's the independent safety auditor signing off on a very rigorous uh, um, uh, system assurance plan. It's thousands of pages of documents signed off by engineers, mechanical engineers, systems engineers, track specialists, where that information is provided to us and is signed off to ensure that the system is safe uh, and again, that's another check that's been built into the contractual requirements. Uh, and then number eight, uh, this is the, the practice uh, plan. Just like your final exam, you want to study, this is uh, RTG uh, has offered to do practice planning. They're not contractually obligated to, it, uh, to do it, but running end to end, uh, 15 uh, double trains, so that they can get ready for some critical tests that leads to RSA. And we think that's an important element that needs to occur. Unfortunately, that has not occurred yet because of the fleet count, uh, but we're, uh, we're looking forward to them achieving that one. So fleet availability, we have some of the best light rail vehicles in the, in the industry. These are built by Alstom. Um, they do, like any vehicle build out, have issues that need to be addressed. It's part of a ramp up of a new fleet. Um, they, uh, they go through them systematically. The testing and commissioning that we're doing, we identify issues. Their technicians, the Alstom technicians identify issues. And there's a whole testing regime to fleet uh, systems. So fleet availability is critical. And uh, you want it to be stable and robust so that when you enter a revenue service, you can depend on the vehicles. This is the tunnel ventilation system that I was talking about. This is one of them. Uh, this is uh, at the bottom of Rideau Station. They're massive, and I wanted to show you this picture because it gives you a, uh, a scale of how large they are. Not only are they large, but they're complicated. They're run by computer systems and subsystems, and they're very, very critical in the event of smoke or fire in a tunnel. Uh, they need to be controlled uh, remotely. They need to be understood and tested and commissioned. Our fire department will depend on these in the event of an incident and uh, they're done around the world. It's not like we're doing anything new, but you need to take your time and go through these safety protocols and ensure that uh, uh, they're robust. We're almost there. RTG has three deliverables that they've committed to giving us uh, in this regard. The monitoring and control systems, um, can't say enough about this. We have these types of rooms uh, throughout the system, uh, literally thousands and thousands of kilometers of wiring, hundreds of thousands of connection points. RTG has done a lot of testing, end-to-end -end testing of all the systems. So these control your fire alarms, your uh, next stop announcements, your escalator controls. Everything gets fed back to the control room so that you can monitor and control your system. So there's a lot of work that's been done in that regard.
And then the power system, you've seen this overhead catenary system. Uh, one of the benefits of the harsh winter that we're getting is certainly RTG and RTM is uh, you know, testing its resiliency. Uh, everything from freezing rain to a lot of snow and so forth. So it's, uh, it's pushing them in terms of testing their equipment, their winter response plans and so forth. And we're working with them. We've had some very good uh, debriefs and lessons learned to date. So, this slide is also very important. This is a reminder of what needs to be done by RTG to get to revenue service availability, the RS RSA. It's contractual obligations. It's non-negotiable. We're not deviating. We're not, uh, unless instructed by council, my line is the same line I've used over and over again. $2.1 billion worth of infrastructure meeting the requirements of that pro project agreement move 10,700 passengers per hour per direction during the peak with the prescribed headways and the end-to-end -end trip times it needs to be reliable and needs to be consistent. Why? Once you flip from bus rapid transit to light rail, you can't unpack that. You'll be the busiest LRT in North America. 325,000 of your customers, and you heard from a lot of them last week, depend on your transit system, that BRT. 80% of them will be affected by this change. It has to work very, very, very well. And so um, I know RTG doesn't like my, I sound like a broken record to them, uh, but I will be unrelenting in ensuring we get what we've paid for and there is no deviation from my perspective and my team's perspective. And I can tell you the city manager has been very consistent in that regard also. So number one, all system assurance, all that safety documentation, finalized, complete, checked, and submitted. All the project construction and site work uh, completed. I know some councillors have asked me what, what are they permitted to leave behind? Landscaping because of the winter. No different than your house when you move in. Some final touch-ups and so forth. Tunnies, I showed you one of the walls. There's some mosaic art tile that needs to go there. In fairness to RTG, they can't do that in cold winter, so they'll do that in the spring but all the major construction work and site work needs to be completed so we can operate that system. All the testing and commissioning requirements, including, and, and this is uh, embedded in the agreement, they have to do what's called a trial running test, 12 consecutive days of near perfect running of the system end to end, including their maintenance regimes. And if they fail, if there's a bad, bad day during that 12 day period, we reset the clock. So again, in RTG's uh, world, they're most interested in getting that practice plan running so they can study for that final exam because they need to, need to uh, uh, get to that point before we can move into revenue service availability and before they get any of uh, the, the remaining payments from us. Compliance with all safety requirements as approved by the, the safety auditor. That's the auditor that's on the project that's different than your oversight auditor, don't mix the two. Uh, his world starts after we go into revenue service. So there's layers of checks and balances, but they have to comply and that auditor has to put in a statement of no objections. So every documentation he receives, he says, I'm fine with this, I don't have any objections. And operational readiness on all fronts, including maintenance. So uh, looking forward to RSA, uh, we're monitoring all the critical elements to ensure they're ready, not just on the build, but also on the maintenance end of things. Um, we're gonna continue our operational readiness program. And then third bullet, planning for RSA, the schedules, the workforce adjustments, route changes, booking logistics, and so forth. I, I wanna pause there for a moment, Mr. Mayor, and just remind everyone, because uh, you know last week we had a transit challenge, and. I heard from many of you, I'm still hearing from many of you, I saw the tweets. We're not tone deaf to that, but a reminder, and, and I remind RTG of this all the time, the changes to getting to revenue service don't turn on a dime. We have to do changes months in advance. So the customers that are, you know, I, could, I could worry about our customers, I worry about our employees, and I worry about yourselves because you're getting the brunt of the complaints. The changes you're seeing and, all the and a lot of the complaints that you're seeing now associate with the route changes we did in anticipation of the November revenue service date change. 
those people that are stuck at Tunney's Pasture, whose roots got changed, or those people in the East End that are seeing some of those challenges, that's because we had to change our roots months in advance. And so when we hear about RSA, we need to have the time to do all our route changes, customer facing interactions, the booking logistics, and it's months in advance in terms of that. So um, detours, changes to routes, it's not all of it. There's other things contributing to it, winter and so forth, but a reminder of that, because that gets lost in some of this discussion. And we're continuing to provide oversight to RTG and of course our Ready for Rail campaign. And lastly, because I know you raise this every, uh, every meeting with me, where are we with our negotiations with RTD, our discussion on deviations and so forth? We're continuing to use the project agreement to work our way through that. We have not, excuse me, issued any payments to RTG, um, and we're, so we're holding back those two very substantial payments. And we're continuing, as the city manager has instructed us, to track all our incremental costs which uh, he's instructed the treasurer to deduct from the outstanding payments of RTG when, uh, when they're in a position to receive those. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That uh, concludes the uh, presentation. Happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Mancone. Good thorough report. Uh, we'll just get the lights uh, turned back up. Uh, so uh, these are questions to both Mr. Mancone and Mr. Louch. Uh, Mr. Louch, um, uh, my question is, uh, will you meet the delivery date of March 31st, 2019, and if so, how confident are you that you're going to meet the deadline that you gave us? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We don't contemplate any other scenario than a handover of 31st of March. The eight items that Mr. Mancone put on the, up, up on the slide that the city is tracking as, as he said, we are aligned, we're tracking those same items. We are satisfied that these are trending in the right direction. There still are some challenges, and I think Mr. Mancone noted fleet availability and end-to-end -end practice plan running. Those are absolutely critical to, to our success. We have a very committed contractor. We have a very committed vehicle supplier. Um, so I am still confident that we will meet our obligation and hand over on the 31st of March. So you recognize if you miss that deadline because you've missed two deadlines so far that you're going to be and your company will be a million dollars poorer. So you have an incentive, obviously, to meet the deadline. We have a lot of incentives, Mr. Mayor. And we're meeting with Mr. Kanalakis and Mr. Manconi and Mr. Morgan on a regular basis to update them on progress on these eight items. We have some obligations in the PA to provide advance notice when we're ready to achieve substantial completion. Right now, we're still on track to do that. But as I said, if there's, you know, we're meeting and updating on these key metrics on a regular basis, and we'll continue to do so. And if things start to deviate, well, we'll have that frank discussion with, with Mr. Mancone, Mr. Kanalakis, and Mr. Morgan. So one of the concerns I have is that uh, you have to meet uh, 12 consecutive days of running. Uh, there are not a lot of days left in February. There's how many days in March? 30, 31 days in March. Um, that seems to put a lot of pressure on you to get 12 consecutive days. Now, I recognize it's not 12 perfect days. If there's a small uh, glitch that's, that's not safety related, that can count as one of the days. But the challenge is if you go to eight days and then all of a sudden you have a major glitch, you've got to roll the clock back to 12 days. So you're still, even with that scenario, confident we can see service uh, or, the, in essence, the keys, as we say, handed over to the city on March 31st. Yeah, yes sir, we are. And that's, and that's a function of the work that we're doing right now. We're doing as much testing and commissioning and checkout as we can. We have not a lot of float, that's for certain. Those 12 days have to run well. And as you noted, they don't, they don't have to be 100%. There's a scorecard where we monitor the success of, of, the, of the day at the end of every day, and that then dictates if we go on to the next day. But the intent is to replicate revenue service, and right now, we're, as I said, we're, we're on track to do so. So the, the, um, the biggest uh, concern I have is obviously the safety of the system and uh, making sure that we receive a system that is 100 uh, percent safe and secure for passengers, for employees. Um, in terms of uh, your concern uh, about any of the uh, aspects such as the, the vent, you want to make sure the ventilation system is, is working. Uh, do you have any concerns at this stage that uh, there are any issues involving public safety that 
we should be made aware of or that uh, may not be in place by the time revenue service begins uh, in April? No, I'm very confident that what we need to have in place for the safety of the public is in place. The critical systems are the TVS, the tunnel ventilation system, as Mr. Manconi explained, and we had the we had the opportunity to show yourself and some of the councillors the complexity of these systems. As Mr. Manconi mentioned, it's, it's a life safety system. It's not about you know, providing heating, ventilation, or air conditioning in, in, the, in the tunnel or the stations. It's hopefully we never use it. Hopefully the only time we run the fans is once a year when we do, when we do testing. But I am quite confident now that those systems are correct. They're operating. We did a final test yesterday. As Mr. Manconi said, we have a few deliverables. Um, engineering documents which we which we have to provide we provided a draft yesterday we'll get some feedback from uh, from mr. Morgan this week and a prerequisite to substantial completion is the safety assurance is the safety certificate from Alstom is the safety certificate from Talos the communication based the train control company that we have a safety certificate from them now by the way but all these things are prerequisites to substantial completion we can't start trial running until we have substantial completion. So we need to satisfy ourselves. Obviously, we need to satisfy the city. But first and foremost, RTG needs to be 100% satisfied that all of the safety prerequisites are in place before we start any kind of trial running. Um, I mentioned that uh, this, this will be the third date that you've given us. Obviously, you were overly optimistic on the other two dates. Uh, why should we believe that uh, you're going to meet the deadline of March 31st when in two other occasions uh, you didn't come close to it. So in a project of this size, with so many different sites going on in parallel, 14 sites, the complexity of the tunnel ventilation system, the uh, computer-based train control system, uh, communications-based uh, train control system, CBTC, there's always some uncertainties. As we get closer and closer to the finish line, those uncertainties are less and less. As I said, tracking those eight key critical items, we're confident now that the level of uncertainty in those items is slowly diminishing to zero. And that's what makes us confident that we can still meet that date. The final point, and either Mr. Manconi and Mr. Uh, Louch can comment on it, the, the issue of deficiencies. I understand in a project of this magnitude that there are going to be uh, literally hundreds of, of deficiencies, some of them significant and some of them uh, less so. Uh, you've worked on large projects like this, Mr. Louch, and as, as your consortium. Um, is there any concern that the, the number of deficiencies that we are experiencing in our system is uh, out of um, uh, you know, uh, perspective, or out of context with, with other major projects of this kind? Mr. Mayor, I don't believe so. We have, as I said, we, we have 14 job sites going on in parallel, three huge underground stations, a very large maintenance and storage facility with lots of rolling stock in the yard. The, you know, as Mr. Manconi said, the article this morning, I mean, it was actually, in my opinion, it was actually not a bad thing because it proves that we're all doing our jobs. Of the metrics that Mr. Willing put in the article, the majority of NCRs are from us, not from the city. We're monitoring our own people. And as well, another, another prerequisite for substantial completion is that we need to make sure that any critical NCR is resolved, completed, and closed. If not, we don't get substantial completion, and then we can't start trial running. We are allowed to have some that are outstanding, but only if they fall under the definition of a minor deficiency under the PA. And we're working very closely. We have regular meetings with the city to review the PA compliance matrices and to review the, uh, to review the uh, deficiency lists. Mr. Mayor, anything on the deficiencies you'd like to add other than what you said earlier in your presentation? No, I, th I think that's, uh, that's it, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, Councillor Egli, that's the floor. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Mayor. Um, just uh, a couple of questions. Uh, first, for uh, I guess for RTG primarily, um, you talked about having a scorecard, so you didn't need to have a perfect 12 days. Um, how far off plum are you allowed to be? So, can you know, do you need a score of 80%, 92%? Like, how does that work? So, at the end of every day, we'll be looking at our scorecard. And the scorecard, there's a minimum percentage that we have to complete or that we have to achieve. And if I recall correctly, it's in the order of 96%. But the parameters that we're measuring. 
They, they run from everything from maintaining of the appropriate head time between the vehicles, the station dwell times, but also uh, some of the facility related items. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a real mix of parameters. Okay, um, just to follow up on, on uh, some of the mayor's one re uh, line of questioning, um, the 12 days concerns me as well. We've got 47 days left before the 31st. Uh, I think we can write off the next couple of days in the city um, because of the snowstorm. You know, uh, so you're, you're getting pretty close. When do you anticipate that you're going to take your first run at getting a 12-day consecutive? What's, what's that target date? So right now we're targeting the second week of March to start trial running. And we do have, we have a little bit of float, but not a lot. Okay. Um, uh, now, Mr. Mancone, I'm going to flip over to you now. So, assuming start middle of March, get your 12 consecutive days, you get it on March 31st. Um, what is your anticipated gap, if you will, before you think you might be able to open it up to the public? What sort of a timing are we looking at? If they, if they achieve uh, March 31st, Mr. Mayor, we need about two weeks of prep work, and then we can get into launch mode. So by the end of April, we're launching. OK, thank you for that. Um, we saw a couple of slides that, that uh, referenced uh, the city safety auditor. And I don't know, I believe he's in the audience. He's not in the audience. OK, well, maybe you can be his proxy. Um, no, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, just, I don't want to confuse. There's two roles. There's the project safety auditor, and then there's the city council one. That's a different mandate. His, his authority only takes over once the project has been signed off to the city and they've achieved RSA. So there is a safety auditor on the actual project site. Different roles. Yeah, no, I understand that. And, and, and the safety auditor that you referenced in the slides is the one that's actually on the project, correct? Um, and you talked about the ventilation system as one of the key components that you want to know is, is working properly in case of fire, what have you. Um, What's your top three safety issues that you're going to want that auditor to, to focus in on and be certain of? Um, there is no top three. That auditor has a mandate to look at all of the system assurance programs, which is based on a very complex risk management model. Uh, so they, uh, early on in the project, they identify all the risks, and they look at all those elements, and that drills through. But on, on tunnel ventilation, as an example, there's a uh, standard industry best practice and regimes that they need to meet. There's codes. There's fire protection codes and so forth. So that safety auditor will look through all that documentation, as will all our staff, and make sure that they're in compliance with all those from a design and an actual field test uh, regime. On top of all that, I know Mr. Lausch, to his credit, he's brought in uh, one of the leading world experts on tunnel ventilations. And we brought in the North American expert on the city side. And when those two individuals got in a room, they were talking the same language, they were talking the same issues. That's how we got down to three, uh, three pieces of information that Mr. Lausch is getting us on, and which included some testing last night. Okay, and I, I want to follow up on, on the discussion about, in effect, two safety auditors. Um, one council appointed, one. So when, when does that shift happen? When does that responsibility shift happen? Is it on March 31st, or is it on opening day of the line? When, walk us through that. When does the city appointed safety auditor take, take control of that aspect? Once the system is launched, I believe after the first year of operation, Mr. Morgan will correct me if I'm wrong, the city's oversight person uh, uh, prepares a report uh, to council on how the system is in compliance with the delegated federal oversight that you got from the, uh, from the federal government, from Transport Canada, because we are self-regulated. So his mandate is to ensure that you're meeting the requirements of Transport Canada's letter to you. So he takes over after the system is launched. Uh, Ms. Morgan, you're leaning towards you. Have something you want to add <laughs> to that answer? No, I, th I mean, I think that's right. Uh, effectively, the compliance officer starts right away. As soon as we go into service, he will put a work plan together uh, to monitor the compliance of the operator, monitor the compliance of the maintainer with the regulations for the system at the end of the first year of service, come back to council and report on those results. Okay, and uh, back to you quickly, Mr. Mancone. So you did reference what our uh, 
what our transit riders have been going through with the changes in anticipation. Um, I think every councillor has at least one route that's more troublesome than the other. Um, in my area, you and I have talked about this many times, the 86. Um, can you walk us through what people who are experiencing difficulties with that route right now can hope to see once the train is in operation? What, what's the benefit going to be to them for the time they've spent waiting for this to happen? Certainly. So if we take the Route 86, and there's, there's a number of them that are similar. Uh, um, last year, we uh, terminated that route at Tunney's Pasture in anticipation of the revenue service being launched in November. Um, and um, prior to that, that route would take you from suburbia all the way to right downtown. Uh, no transfer needed. Uh, currently, they get off at Tunney's Pasture and they have to do a transfer onto another bus to get them to downtown. Yes, there's many options, but they do have to, uh, we've introduced a transfer. Um, when the train opens, they will uh, get off at Tunney's Pasture. They will not need to worry during the peak periods about any schedule because the trains come very, very frequently, less than every five minutes. They go down to the concourse, there's a train waiting or a train soon approaching, and they head downtown. And the value proposition is, yes, you're injecting a transfer, but your reliability uh, increases in terms of your end destination. And then the piece that isn't ta being talked enough about is the bus routes that used to go in deep into downtown and get caught into local traffic will stay in their neighborhoods in the east, the west, and the south, so bus reliability will also increase. So you'll have a better commute getting to your transfer point. If you are transferring to rail, uh, the reliability will increase because those buses don't have to go into downtown. So there'll be a, a positive on the bus side. There's reliability in terms of your commute. And then as you expand the system into stage two and so forth, you start to leverage uh, quicker commute times, more reliability, and so forth. And reminder that stage one was your critical infrastructure build of the tunnel because you could not move any more buses through the core. So you had to build this first piece to get that capacity, which unlocks you for the next 30 years. Okay, th uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Councillor uh, El Shantiri, please. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Mr. Mancone and team. Uh, Mr. Mancone, on slide 25, you said the city will continue to track all incremental costs, which will be deducted from uh, RTG's outstanding payment. W would those numbers be brought to this committee to see how did you end up with whatever the number is going to be? Uh, we've done a couple of things, uh, Mr. Mayor. We, uh, we brought a report to Transit Commission last year with the first uh, delay. The Treasurer issued a memo, I believe, it was uh, in December on the uh, total to date. And thirdly, we've built in uh, the recoveries into your budget that's before you, so you'll see that. We can certainly elaborate that either at Transit Commission or uh, at FEDCO or at uh, Council uh, entirety. And then any continued adjustments just get added to that, and we just adjust uh, incrementally, so it's a month by month on that basis. But there was a memo that was issued in December, and in the future, if Council wants to have the tally, we can certainly update that. So that tally would become public information or public knowledge. That's what I'm trying to get at. I'll ask the Treasurer to comment on that. Uh, certainly, Councillor, we can bring the information to this committee to say how much we have deducted from it. I can't guarantee that it would be before the payment, though. We have a very tight window. We have five days to make the payment when we finally receive the, uh, the independent certifiers um, um, go ahead to do, it, to do so. So if there's no meeting scheduled, I wouldn't be able to, but we would bring it to the next meeting after that. So eventually we'll, we'll come to, the, to this committee with the, with the tally of uh, all the increments. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Treasurer. Let, my other question, Mr. Mayor, is uh, Mr. Manconi, you talk on uh, slide, I believe, 2023. 20, uh, uh, some, it's not going to be complete. Uh, uh, and, and you talk about some of the landscaping and some of the other stuff where weather permitted. But you know as well as I do, the first uh, reaction of people is to see, uh, obviously, as a finished product. Is you know, like, like you can have a beautiful house, but if it's going to be a middle of mud and you can't walk to get to the house, really, it's not something. So, how much your expectation is going to be uh, incomplete work before the opening day? Mr. Mayor, I think we'll be fine there. Again, um, RTG did a big push on landscaping in the fall. 
Um, and so, you know, go to Tunney's Pasture, which was the last station. Um, you, you're walking on Interlock. The trees were planted, all those things. There's, uh, there's a stone wall that was done there, the bike racks and so forth. I, I, I think there'll just be a few spots on that. And then even on things such as signage and, and deckling and so forth, their heating areas, those big white lanterns that you see everywhere, there's, they're going to have a big O on them, a red O. Uh, I know Mr. Lausch is going to heat those things up and then put the decals on them and so forth. And that's why I was showing you the finishes also. So it, I, that first impression is an important impression. Um, and then you have the underground stations, which, you know, Rito, uh, when you go through those entrances, uh, everything's finished uh, on both sides and inside the, the Rito Mall itself. So I, I, I believe it'll be minor in some cases. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Marconi. Thanks, uh, Councillor Elshantiri. Councillor Leeper, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I might just ask the uh, camera person uh, in front of me to uh, step aside for a moment. Thank you. Um, a couple of different questions. Uh, I think the fleet availability uh, slide was maybe a little uh, glossed over. Mr. Mancona, you said that there was work to do to get fleet availability. We need to have 15 double trains ready at RSA and we need to have four spares. Is there a point, at what point do we say a, tra a, a vehicle is ready? There's some sort of a certification? Yes, there's a very rigid uh, vehicle acceptance process. Uh, there's um, testing, commissioning, uh, and then you put them out on the track and you run them and you make sure that all the systems and the subsystems are working and they need to be near perfect. Uh, there can't be any major uh, uh, issues. There's thousands of parts on those systems, uh, on those vehicles, and um, they do get thoroughly checked. We have vehicle experts uh, that oversee that and then there's a very rigid process for acceptance and then sign over for, to the city. So that sign over is, is a very specific identifiable step at which we can say the vehicle is ready? There's a whole clear line of path of documentation, system assurance, safety assurance, and so forth, best practices that gets applied. So for those uh, 15 double vehicle, or, you know, for the, the 30 trains plus four spares, where are we? Uh, what level of certification are each of those at at this point? Do they all have that certification as ready? No, we're, we're getting there. Um, the vehicles, like any other fleet, uh, particularly a new fleet, and remember, this is proven technology, the platform of this vehicle, but it's been uh, winterized, so there's extra glazing, insulation, and, and other uh, systems, and the ability to go up to 100 kilometers an hour for your future expansion phases, which the vehicle has done in its test track. Um, so there's a series of uh, quote-unquote deficiencies that uh, go through retrofits, no different than when you buy a new bus, a new car, and so forth. There's been three rounds of those. They've done all those. Uh, there's been, been some issues with uh, emergency door releases. There was a defect on those. They've uh, found that defect and they're retrofitting them as we speak. They have four technicians on that. And then we're left with, uh, currently there's an issue with auxiliary power. It's, I don't want to get too technical, but there's an issue uh, with uh, some power units on the vehicles, which they need to look at root cause. That's restricting them from getting the vehicles to, even before that final phase, but getting as many of them out on the track as they can. So uh, we're watching that very, very carefully, and that's why I'm very concerned about the fleet availability right now. And, you know, we would have hoped by now to have had 15 double vehicles going uh, from Tunney's to Blair. We have not done that. So how many we've had is eight at one time, single vehicle. And of those eight, uh, are any of them certified, for want of a better word, as, as um, complete, finished? I'll let Mr. Morgan comment. He's, uh, he's a vehicle uh, person. So there's the, you know, the crux of them is getting the approval from the train control supplier that they're ready to go, that they can put in, be put into service. There's a final cleanup effort with decals and the last kind of interior finishes that uh, is, is less critical to proving that the, the train is ready to go. Um, but we have a schedule from RTG that shows all of those vehicles being done before the trial running period. So there's still a bit of work left to be done. We're not, we're not there yet. There's still more work, um, but we're, you know, we have a group of vehicles, approximately 24, that have signed off by the train control supplier. Um, we need to get the, the remaining 10. We need to get the remaining defects on the vehicle sorted out. And I'm sorry, I, I missed the, uh, the last numbers there. How many um, vehicles? Uh, well, oh. 30, uh, so the train oh, control yeah. supplier has signed off 24 out yeah. of the 34. Okay. So we're, we're 
getting through it. We're not there yet. We have a bit more work to do, but it is coming. It doesn't sound then like the remaining issues to finally certify the remainder of those vehicles are, are overly difficult to solve. Are you confident that we can get those uh, in time? Um, I would be very cautious with that statement. Your vehicles, uh, until we get there, I can't, I, I won't agree with you on that one. Okay. No, that is good to know. Um, a second uh, question, Mr. Manconi, um, first, what is the value of the payments that have been withheld to date thus far? Approximately 262, I'm looking at uh, the treasurer. Uh, it's about $262 million is what we have, and that's split into two payments, not 50-50. There's a substantial uh, completion payment, then there's a revenue service availability payment. So that incentivizes them to get to that 12 days of consecutive trial running. So 262 in, in uh, payments outstanding. We have uh, we are tracking the the incremental cost to the system. Uh, again, can you just uh, give me a, a ballpark figure of, of what that number is right now? I believe the December uh, memo was 25 million dollars. And just okay. looking at the treasurer. Uh, off the top of my head, I'd have to say that's probably close to correct. <laughs> Uh, somewhere in the ballpark of $25 million. Just to understand the mechanism, it is the city's intent to make those final payments when the thresholds are met, but we'll be withholding the cost that we counted as being incremental uh, due to the delay? The city manager has given us instructions to deduct all incremental costs that the city has incurred, which balances your budget so that we're not in a, in a deficit position. Okay. on operating and uh, all the incremental costs getting us because of the delay. And Mr. Loach, is, is it uh, RTG's intention to, um, uh, to, to accept that mechanism? Is that mechanism acceptable to, uh, to RTG? Uh, Mr. Mayor, no, it is not. We have a, we have a, a disagreement with, uh, with Mr. Manconi in the interpretation of the rights and obligations that the city has under the PA. Um, in our mind, in our opinion, it's very clear what the, uh, the rights are as far as delay claims. Um, where it's very clear as to what, um, if there are options for set off, which there isn't. However, we do have a good working relationship with Mr. Manconi and we will have this discussion and we will hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll work through this. Can I uh, maybe ask for, uh, for legal input? I, 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 I want to understand what that looks like when you've met your thresholds. We go into RSA, uh, the, uh, the treasurer. Excuse me. I don't think we should be getting into negotiating our strategy in terms of how we're dealing with RT. Uh, we hold the purse, and uh, direction has been given very clearly that uh, RTG is not to be paid for our, our uh, costs incurred. So unless you have a, a general question, I don't believe it would be appropriate in, in open session to negotiate uh, or reveal our strategy. I, I just want to understand where does that go from the point at which it is a, um, uh, where does it go from the point at which it is a disagreement? Yeah, well, eventually mediation and then uh, litigation. Okay. But in the meantime, the, the that has been withheld is still sitting within city coffers. That's Interest. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tierney. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, John, you might have to route these questions a little bit. Uh, with two stations in my ward, I kind of have a front row seat, and I've certainly seen the trains go a lot faster. I've seen the cross tracks working. Uh, but when we get to the 12 days of Christmas, I guess you could say, uh, what will we envision as the number of cars? Uh, will you be testing as if it's a regular work day as well as peak periods? Is there a whole schedule around that? What can we expect to see in the community? Mr. I don't think your mic is on, Councillor, or uh, Mr. Manco, let me try it again. There we go. Can you hear me now? There we go. Uh, Councillor Tierney, uh, the, uh, the testing uh, requires them to demonstrate their capabilities on all service modes. So morning peak, afternoon peak, fr evening peak, uh, weekend service, Sunday service, all those regimes. So it's intended to simulate the entire um, a service curve from uh, the, the full seven day period through that. So they run through various scenarios on that. So that's great. So the coupling of cars and just a rough estimate, how many trains would be rolling around in a peak period, for example? 
morning rush hour, you need 15 double vehicles to carry the volume that's uh, required at the headway that's required. Great. And then it scales back from that to Sunday service being your lowest. Wonderful. The, the next question, and I don't know if it's RTG or S, so the 31st of March rolls around, we get the keys, everything's happy and good. Uh, come April 1st, there's a bit of a labyrinth, as you know, at, uh, at Blair Station uh, for safety purposes, the construction site, all the fencing, it's a bit of a maze to get in and out. I do have quite a few questions about, will all those fencings be removed when you guys turn the keys back over? Is that, is that a RTG situation? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, that's us. We have to provide you a complete station without any temporary fences, without any construction material. We have to make sure that everything is tidy and that will be done. Wonderful. And my last question, I bring it up time and again just because we see the extra uh, traffic pressures on Innes, Montreal and Ogilvy Road. Uh, we're working collectively with the, uh, with the uh, province and the ministry, I assume, on the ramp timing. We've had this discussion about uh, getting that uh, 417 to 174 ramp back open. Uh, does it require coordination from RT, just, just specifically us working on that? Uh, Mr. Lausch is integrated with us on the um, peeling back of all the detours and Mr. Landry who's the head of that for traffic knows that that one is our top priority because that's the pressure point for for a lot of people so there's a staging and sequencing of that uh, that we have to it's integrated with Mr. Lausch but it's it's the city and uh, RTG working together great thank you Mr. Mayor thank you Councillor Tierney Councillor Dudas please Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to get a better, bit of a better understanding in regards to the deadline. So we're looking at March 31st. Mr. Louch, you're very confident that that's, you're going to make it. I'd like to understand how the penalty comes into effect. So if by some chance, you know, the 31st passes and you just can't make it, those 12 days have come and gone, OC Transpo doesn't feel comfortable taking the keys, when do we impose that penalty? Where is it in the contract that says that that penalty comes into effect at 12 midnight? As soon as they miss it, uh, we send them a notice saying that they've missed it, so the penalty is in effect. Um, and then it resets the clock. They have to give us a new date for RSA. So there is no grace period. As of midnight on the 31st of March, we can impose that, that uh, penalty. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And my, my second question is, y there is going to be a tight turnaround even for OC Transpo once you've received the keys, the keys, um, and you're testing. What are you doing to uh, really prepare customers in that interim while you're testing and getting them ready for the actual launch of, of the train? So the, uh, the Ready for Rail campaign uh, spells that out. We have a, a report uh, coming to Transit Commission in March which uh, does the final push on introduction out to all the customers uh, in terms of that. Uh, there's, um, so it's, it's really an amping up of that information to the customers, those videos that we talked about. Uh, there's gonna be a video on the, on the vehicle. There's going to be mail outs to, uh, to customers. There's going to be uh, lots of social media presence. So we're really, we're uh, is March 31st locked in. We don't want to do a false start with our customers. They've got enough to manage right now. So we're incrementally feeding them information. Once we get lock in on that date, then we can move forward uh, with a full push. In March, we're giving the Transit Commission a full briefing on all of the elements of how the system will work at the granular level from a, all wrapped around the customer lens. And one last question, what's the next milestone in which we will know the progress? Because I mean, there's a lot, you're, you're, you've got a tight time frame. Will we hear again as to where this project is at? I, I look to the mayor, I believe uh, we will continue to report to FEDCO on, uh, on updates. So from the city side of things, we will go there. Contractually, Mr. Lausch has a bunch of periods that he has to achieve throughout the month of February and uh, so at the next FEDCO meeting, we'll certainly know whether or not uh, they're tracking in the right direction. Okay, so if there's any project slippage, we'll know about it. Good, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor, and that, that will take place here at FEDCO. Uh, Councillor Deans, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Raj, for being kind of a rare sighting for us. And, uh, you know, it's happy to, we're happy to see you and appreciate you taking the time. And I can certainly appreciate your desire and your motivation um, to 
hand over the keys to the City of Ottawa on March 31st. But I also saw that long laundry list and they weren't small things that need to be completed in a very short time frame. So my question really is to you, Mr. Manconi, where is your confidence level that this system is going to be ready for the city to accept on March 31st? And of course, as a taxpayers and representative of the taxpayers in this city, as we're, we all want this train system to run, but we don't want to take it if it's not ready because we're just transferring the risk from RTG to the taxpayers. So where are you in your confidence level that this system is ready to transfer to us on March 31st? Thank you, Councillor. Um, so uh, Mr. Lausch knows how I'm going to answer this because we've been uh, doing our due diligence as we've done with every single revenue service availability date that they've given us and oversight on the project. And when, when I talk about assessments, that's not just a tabletop exercise. That's pros, experts that have tested and commissioned railroads uh, from across North America. Some, we have some, we're, we're blessed. We have some of the best in the, in the industry working with us. Um, and so I am concerned about March 31st. Um, the, um, I'd ho I would have hoped to have been here with those eight elements uh, when we did our assessment at the end of January. All of those eight elements tracking very, very well, but they're not closed off. And so, as uh, somebody alluded to uh, early on, there's only days to get to March 31st. Uh, I'm, um, uh, I'm happy to be wrong. Uh, but I'm highly skeptical that they're going to uh, achieve March 31st. Um, and uh, I'm not suggesting that RTG is proposing this, but there is no, unless I'm directed by council, to accept a, sub, a subpar system. And, and, and to RTG's credit, everything they're building, and once it gets done and tested and commissioned, is state of the art, it's top notch, it's, it's right up there. But um, uh, they have to understand that this system has to be very, very robust for those 325,000 customers that we move around every single day. We will not have a chance to launch. So uh, if I'm wrong and they do make it by March 31st, I'm perfectly fine with that. But uh, I have to tell, uh, tell council uh, that based on our assessment, um, there, is, uh, there is not a high prob there's, there's no probability they're going to make March 31st from our perspective. Uh, without deviation from the project agreement, without accepting sub, um, sub, uh, not subpar, but a reduced service level or something like that. So um, uh, there's no surprises here. I'm, you know, Mr. Lausch knows my position in that regard. We are agreeing to disagree. He is tracking to March 31st. If they make it and they pass all those tests, that's great. If they don't, uh, we're in a different predicament. So. Mr. Manconi, who is the ultimate arbiter? of whether or not that system is ready for handing over to the city. If Mr. Lush is handing you the keys and you're not taking them, who decides? He can't do that because of those steps that I talked about. And that's why there's no us and them here. I, you know, this is a P3 and I respect Mr. Lush's commercial interests. I respect them as an organization and they have a 30 year uh, deal that we need to work through. We, they want a great product, we want a great product. Where they want great service, we want great service, but um, it, it is so obvious and very straightforward how you get to that revenue service availability. You can't skirt around it. There's no okay. secret path to getting to that RSA. Safety auditor, 12 consecutive days, it's all been signed off, it's contractually uh, secured. So, uh, and, and to their credit, they, they haven't tried to, to circumvent. We've had discussions about, you know, what deviations can we leave, the landscaping and tile works and stuff like that, but they know what they have to deliver. So, Mr. Lesh, where do you get the confidence that you can deliver when you're so at odds with uh, Mr. Manconi? So, we were, Mr. Manconi and I were aligned on the critical items. And I think we both recognize which ones are trending positively and which ones are still potentially at risk. And as Councillor Leeper said, fleet availability, that's one of, that's one of our concerns right now. And, the, and fleet, avail, fleet availability leads into end-to-end -end practice plans. So 
We're very happy, very comfortable with occupancy, tunnel ventilation systems. We have a world-class vehicle supplier who's committed to the Maybe date with us. Maybe speak a little closer to the microphone. Oh, sorry, sir. Uh, we've, we've got a world-class vehicle supplier who's committed to the date with us. It's not just us arbitrarily pick, picking this date. We have full commitment. They've increased their resources. They've increased their vehicle technical staff to try to help us get more vehicles on track. And just to follow up on Mancone's point, I mean, it's, we are also a customer. We have a supplier, a design build supplier that is providing us with the system and with the facilities. We have a vehicle supplier. We need to be satisfied first. We have absolutely no intention of bringing Mr. Mancone and Mr. Morgan to the table and saying, here you go, if we've not satisfied all requirements 100% ourselves. Okay, so when, when do you believe that you will know if you're in a position to hand over the system on March 31st? Okay. Thank you. The, as Mr. Mancone said, we have criteria within the PA, we have to give notices. So we have to give an advance notice to believe substantial completion will be achieved because that's, that's basically tools down. And then, and then the independent certifier in the city, they opine on the, on, on the completeness of our system and then they will decide after their particular opinion periods if we're ready or not. So the next several weeks are very important. The next several weeks we need to see multiple vehicles on the test track. We need to start, we need to start having a, a robust practice plan. And we'll continue to monitor and we'll continue to update the city on a regular basis. We have weekly meetings with the, with the executive committee of our, of our subcontractor, with Mr. Kanalakis, Mr. Mancone, Mr. Morgan. When will the taxpayers have a clear indication of whether or not the system is being handed over on March 31st? It's literally weeks away. Weeks away. And how will that be communicated to um, the taxpayers. Well, I'm, uh, again, I look to the mayor. I, I would report through to FEDCO on the next update in that regard. Okay, I just want to ask some specifics. We talked a lot about systems integration and that all those different systems speaking to each other. How is that, where are we in terms of completion of that integration of the system? So, I guess, uh, you know, the first thing that we start with is a power system, uh, overhead catenary network, substation network. All those systems are connected back to uh, Belfast Yard, the Transit Operations Control Center through a SCADA system. Uh, that SCADA system is working, it's complete. Uh, the systems, the trains on the track also communicate via the CPDC, the communication-based train control system, back to the control center. Those systems are in place. Uh, we're in final testing on those. Uh, we haven't seen 30 vehicles on the track. Um, we've seen between four and eight vehicles on the track. Um, so we're tracking well on the systems integration tests. Um, the issue is the last five or 10 tests are, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Show us that you have 30 vehicles running on the system to the headway that we agreed to. Uh, that's what's missing. Um, all the individual subsystems, we're getting there slowly. The tunnel ventilation system is connected uh, to, to the control center for us to be able to turn it on and turn it off. Uh, we're into final analysis of testing results. All the individual subsystems are coming together. We need that final test. We need the practice running. We need the trial running to show that it all works. It meets our expectations for service and that we are conf confident that we can put it into service. Is there a particular problem with the west end of this system? Because people are telling me that it's a rare sighting of trains running over on the Tunney's Pastures the line. Thank you. No, there's, there's no particular problem. Um, one of the reasons that we weren't running as many trains on the west end as you may have seen about a month ago is because we were doing tunnel ventilation testing and to do some of the tunnel ventilation testing and the checkouts, we need to shut off power in the tunnel. So, so the tunnel, of course, is the conduit to get vehicles out to, to the west end. So we deliberately restricted that for a short period of time. Okay. And, um, um, the media have been reporting water in the tunnel. Is that a, an issue? No, it's not an issue. We is have there water in the tunnel? Or was there water in there the was, tunnel? There was during construction, there was water in the tunnel. We also had uh, temporary sump pumps and temporary drains in place. 
We have fully functional permanent redundant systems in place right now. There's, we're in, we're in the state final stages of, of there is some water infiltration, um, or there was, I should say, but we're in the final stages of mitigating that now. So there's no worry about water seeping into the tunnel in the future? No, there's not. Okay. Um, uh, can I just add to that, Councillor? Yeah. So, uh, and this will be some of our education to the public. Every tunnel has water in it. You go to New York, you go to Chicago, they all have water. There's collection systems for that. It's, it's not pouring in or gushing in, but uh, um, this notion that we'll never have water in the tunnel, I know that's not what you're saying, but others, just for clarity. Uh, the, the big news item that was the tunnel was flooded was a sump pump, a construction pump in the West End. Uh, I'm defending RTG here because uh, I know the incident. It was a construction site at the end of the tunnel and uh, the sump pump was clogged. A worker went there, unclogged it, and the, uh, the, the tunnel was drained. But uh, every tunnel will have some leak into it always you get to Boston you can see that New York City and so forth so thank you for that uh, Mr. Mancani I believe I heard you say that there has been no testing of the trains that have been coupled together so no, there has been some of that we're looking but no end-to-end -end testing there has been end-to-end -end of a few of those vehicles we want to see 15 double vehicles end-to-end -end going in um, all at once as mr morgan just said and does that include loading and unloading of customers when you do the end-to-end -end testing with the full system running um, what it does is it simulates the, uh, the doors actually open and close at every station, so all of the headways and the, the times they need to meet will simulate full service during the testing period and then also the 12 consecutive days. We're also doing some customer loading of the systems from an operational perspective, so we have volunteers that are going to come in and load the vehicles and, and, and do some testing of that. Okay, those are my questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Brockington, please. Thank you, Your Worship, and good morning. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for the presentation. Just over here. Um, I'm concerned what I've heard over the last hour, just because we have the conflicting information. Mr. Louch, you've given a fairly confident or positive outlook that you are aware of the outstanding tasks. You're aware of how long each task takes, and you're able to estimate with confidence today that you're able to deliver by March 31st. Mr. Mancone counters by saying he has no, uh, no probability that this will be delivered by March 31st. What is your degree of probability that you will be able to deliver by the end of March? I'm not going to be able to give you a, a percentage of probability, but I can tell you that, that the, we're not contemplating another date other than the 31st of March right now. We do have a difference of opinion, and it's but we are tracking we are tracking the same items and as as i said the next few weeks are very telling not only do we have to provide a, a substantial completion notice but we won't be able to provide that notice if we do not have multi-vehicles on the test track if we don't start doing more robust end-to-end -end testing i'm optimistic but i'm a realist as well we need to make sure that we trend towards zero uncertainties over the next couple of weeks but you still believe confidently you can deliver by March 31st? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mancone, I visited three stations last week as part of my journeys across Ottawa. I was at Bayview a number of times. Bayview was not profiled on, in your presentation today. Are there still outstanding work to be done, not just at Bayview, but at any other station? And if so, what is the outstanding work other than landscaping? Uh, I know Bayview very well. I go by there just about every night, and I drive Mr. Lausch and Mr. Morgan crazy my text about uh, things that I observe. Uh, there's minor uh, finishes. There's uh, the steel columns have uh, a facade that needs to be put on that. The rest is essentially complete. Uh, there's some minor things I know they're doing on the second uh, level, and Mr. Lausch can maybe add, but as far as I know, most of it's done. Yeah, as aside from some of the seasonal work, some of the landscaping, and, and that in itself is quite minor. It's in, in, at Bayview, it's mostly sodding and a few trees on the, on the north side. And as Mr. Mancone mentioned, if you notice in some of the stations, you'll see a green sort of siding that's on some of the, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the steel columns. There's a flashing. There's a stainless steel flashing that goes around there. That's what's outstanding. 
Thank you. And Mr. Manconi, um, you talked about in March your presentation will focus on how the system works and providing some information to members of council in that regard. I'm really interested in the education component for members of the public. They've gone through a lot over the last few years with the detours, the challenges with routes. I think the delays have eroded some of the confidence in the system overall. And this is really a good news story. The LRT opening is a good news and I think everyone uh, needs to help get that good word out. What is the specific education campaign rollout promotion that OC Trans was going to undertake when LRT opens to get people interested, re-engaged, riding the rails? That's my first question. And the other question, still with respect to education, is around safety. What if an incident happens in the tunnel from minor to major? How will people who are in the trains or waiting at platforms know what to do? What is the education campaign going to be to get people aware of how to evacuate, um, how to react to certain situations? Are we going to have that type of education? Uh, yes, Councillor, you're spot on. Uh, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in March. It's uh, um, uh, educating, uh, informing, uh, creating some of that buzz, also talking about you know, what happens if the system goes down, so you, what's called bus bridging in the industry, that you know, if the train breaks down, where do you go for your nearest bus and so forth, emergency evacuations. We will highlight many of the best in class emergency features that we have. Uh, vehicles can't get stuck in between stations and so forth, all those things. So that's all coming uh, in March at a very high level and then we're also going to equip you with a bunch of tools, both uh, social media tools, hard copy media tools, articles in your local papers, newsletters, and so forth. So it's all waiting. Uh, we're waiting for that, you know, we have a clear line of sight onto the launch period. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Meehan, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my question would be to, I guess, Mr. Banconi and Mr. Lausch. Uh, we learned of some non-compliance issues with uh, the ongoing construction of the, of the um, LRT through access to information. What I would like to know is if we're going to have a complete list uh, that will be submitted to the city um, for transparency's sake of all the non-compliance issues that we have seen, how they have been remediated, which ones cannot be remediated, and what ongoing problems we can expect. Because we, we've heard about drains being clogged that cannot be opened because there's concrete in them. Um, there are concerns about concrete quality. So I would like to know if there's going to be a, a, a complete list throughout the construction right till the time we take over the keys that uh, we can look to all the time to see, you know, where are we when it comes to uh, that construction and, and whether we're confident in what's been done to uh, fix it. So, Mr. Mayor, as I said during my presentation, all, um, all of those items that uh, were identified, were either identified by RTG or, insp or our inspector staff. Um, I know at the high level, I think we have about uh, 850 total, which again is not significant given a, a project of this scope and scale. 720 of those are closed, 122 of those are being worked on with uh, the city and RTG. Uh, and as I've said, in terms of the sa system assurance program, the so uh, auditor oversight, substantial completion, uh, all these matters will be dealt with. Either they will be addressed and closed off, or there's agreement by the city that they can be left as is. And I note the center, including you know, one in today's report, talked about a potential tile being compromised because of some, uh, some honeycombing on concrete. So all of these need to be put in perspective. The, uh, the drainage issue in the pipe, I can tell you Mr. Lausch and our team are working with our building inspectors. Uh, RTG has given us some proposals about enhanced maintenance regimes so that the sump doesn't have residue left in it and so forth. So um, anything major I can assure you is being dealt with and uh, the minor ones are either being closed off or they'll be signed off by the city that we can live with that. And I remind everybody that there is a building code oversight on this project. Uh, which is legislated and mandated by the province, including elevators and escalators, critical systems, hydro, and so forth. Mm -hmm. I thank you for that. Can I just ask one other question? 
when we missed the other deadline, uh, it impacted a lot of bus routes. So at what point, uh, before we hand over the keys and we go to the new light rail system, are we going to trigger the changes in the buses? And uh, um, last time we couldn't but we had already, you know, what we had done, and it caused a lot of headaches. So at what point are we going to, to do that transition? That's a great question, and uh, I can tell you there's a team, an army of OC Transport staff right now that are sitting on pins and needles trying to figure out whether if March 31st occurs, we pull the trigger on those final route changes, because you're absolutely right, Councillor. We do not want to invoke any more stress on our customers. And uh, to Mr. Lausch's point, that's why I'm pushing hard about we need to know if they're going to make March 31st. Now we've got to go to Plan B. Um, I am not imposing March stress and change on our customers. Uh, the system has to launch and we'll do the changes to the bus routes. They can't take any more in terms of that. They've gone through enough. Mr. Beckhart, what is plan B? Don't change the routes until they go to um, a new date that we are confident in. So yeah. another, I'm answering your question. Mm -hmm. I'm not changing the bus routes mm -hmm. until we know that they're going to make the March 31st or any RSA date. Does it make sense if uh, you believe that it's a we were going to meet the, meet the March 31st deadline to keep that deadline? I mean, I understand it triggers a thousand uh, million dollar penalty for RTG, but wouldn't it be better today to say maybe we should put this off into the future, like make it, make it a little bit further in, in advance and not have it every, everything being pushed together and not everyone concerned that we're not going to make that deadline anyway? Two things, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to look to Mr. O'Connor. I think we're entering into uh, uh, a contractual discussion here. Uh, remember, it's RTG's date. I can't tell them to move the date. Uh, you've heard from the CEO that it's but I would caution us on having a discussion about moving dates or forcing them to move dates because then, uh, Mr. Mayor, you'll own it all. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Luloff, please. Thanks so much for coming today, guys. Uh, the RSA date calls for uh, operational readiness on all fronts. Are you confident that the infrastructure at Blair Station is sufficient to accommodate the massive increase in transferring passengers coming and going from Blackburn Hamlet or Lee Cumberland during peak hours, especially uh, in the afternoon when pregnant are going to be at their highest? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, just to uh, that transfer to, uh, question is an important one. You'll recall in my last update, I don't recall uh, if you were here for that, Councillor, we're doing stress tests on all the major transfer stations, uh, and I can't remember if we've done uh, Blair yet. I know we've done Herdman. We're doing Tunnies. I think it's imminent. And what we do is we load it up um, literally in the middle of the night with uh, a lot of buses. We simulate the volume it's supposed to take through the transfer points, which is out of the computer model. We want to see the model is real. And then we also push it to the braking point. So we do stalled buses as a simulation, an accident simulated, and so forth, so we can do bypassing around the station. We've done Herdman. I can certainly find out when Tunney's and the other station is being done. That transfer is, uh, is very, very important, and uh, we are testing the design elements. So instead bus perspective, how about from the passenger's perspective? Uh, how many passengers can the Blair Station platforms actually handle uh, at both the LRT and the local levels, and are there going to be massive pressures faced by the actual passengers on those platforms? I don't have those numbers here, but I can tell you they've all been sized uh, for current and future growth. I can get Mr. Scrimger to follow up directly with you on all that. There's been a lot of modeling and thought process on uh, customer volume platforms inside the stations and so forth. Uh, with the trim road parking ride and the Orleans parking ride at max capacity before 7 a.m. Uh, every day, are you worried that customers will drive to Blair Station? And do you think that there will be enough parking capacity to accommodate those who choose to do so? Again, uh, I think what I'll do is, if, if it's okay with you, Councillor, I'll get Mr. Scrimger and myself and Mr. Morgan to sit down with you and walk through that. I'd, I'd want to look at all those numbers in there. Uh, a reminder that, you know, this relates to the transportation master plan, there's going to be shifts citywide on how people are going to adapt and change their commute. Uh, so we may not have the answer for you on that. I can tell you what we're sized for and how we're going to accommodate uh, but yeah, there will be changes in travel patterns and people will want to adjust based on what works best for them. Thank you very much. Right, thank you, Councillor Lulof. Councillor Blay, please. 
Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and thanks for the present uh, presentation. Uh, last year, when the first delay happened, we uh, specifically did not want to undo the array of uh, bus changes that had already taken place to accommodate the train because it's a lot of work and it's a lot of confusion and we thought that the first delay would be in the grand scheme of things relatively short. It's now been a year or your virtual 100% lack of confidence that April will be achieved makes it virtually a year. Um, and presumably the can will be kicked down the, 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 the curb a little bit, not not a lot. I guess I'm wondering how are we, I appreciate not doing the changes, the small, the small number of changes that are still left, but what are we going to do to help the people who have already experienced your change and are already going through the pain today? Well, I think with some of the dialogues we've had with yourselves and some of the actual customers, uh, we continue to help them and support them. I know that at Tunney's um, and certainly in Barhaven, some of the challenges out there, there was people buses that they didn't have to wait for. They didn't know there was other travel options for them. So we, we you know, sent out a, a team of uh, OC Transport customer service reps, both in Fa at Fallowfield and at Tunney's, asking people, what bus are you waiting for? Did you know you could hop on any other bus to get to downtown? And so forth. I think those are all the things that we, uh, we can continue to do. Uh, communications, uh, weather, all those things will help. Um, short of unpacking the, the complex matrix of bus routes and untangling that web. Okay, and so the contract is structured, if I recall correctly from the language, there are all sorts of notification periods, you know, 30 days for this, the 60 days for this, 10 days for this, etc. If they're not going to hit um, uh, the new deadline, there's obviously a notice period uh, that they have to provide to us ahead of that. The, the deadline is preceded by substantial completion, again, notice periods. So when are we going to know? Uh, you know, the deadline is, what, two weeks away, I guess? Um, you said eminently, but is eminently next Wednesday we're going to find out, or is it, you know, mid-March? No, Councillor, I didn't say eminently. I said weeks. I'm agreeing with Mr. Lausch. He has commitments within weeks to produce documentation, and um, I can not to or hurry up or anything like that. He's got his obligations to meet, so it was weeks, so I, I defaulted to the mayor and I said that at the next FEDCO meeting we'd let sure. you know where we're at. I, I get that, but I guess where I'm going is once, you know, if, if your scenario comes true and they need to meet the deadline, then they're providing the notification within weeks. Uh, the contract then gives them an uh, additional period of time to provide a new RSA date. I think it's 60 days or, or something like this, and presumably that RSA date will be further into the future than the 60 days. So we're then stretching everything out even further. This is what I'm, I'm saying. We've already gone a year. Lots of people have been in pain for a year. What are we planning to alleviate, alleviate that pain if your worst case scenario, which you said was very, very high, comes to pass? Councillor, I'm open to suggestions. I don't know. I, I think you're asking me, will I unpack the route changes? I'm telling you that's a very complicated thing to do. We've had this discussion, you and I. I, I other than that, uh, take care of our customers, uh, work with you individually, communicate things. Uh, five details, lots of routes that have been changed. We're, we're down the road significantly. Um, and uh, that's why Mr. Lausch hears about it from me literally every single day that we need to have high degree of confidence to get to that RSA date. So I'm open to suggestions if you have any thoughts as to what, uh, what we should do. I will say this too though, there are lots of parts of the city that are functioning just fine. There's hundreds of thousands of people that are commuting without issues. The issue is, I've said over and over, if you're that one customer whose bus didn't show up or your bus skips you by, it's not a good day for you. So there are hundreds of those that are occurring, if not thousands, every day. But I don't have the magic solution for you to, uh, to do that. I'm open to any suggestions you may have. So there have been uh, and a number of uh, downtown infrastructure projects that, have did, that were originally planned to be occurring after LRT was uh, already fully implemented. There are more coming this year. What are we doing to coordinate that construction to ensure more of the downtown isn't completely shut down while the train still isn't available to us? 
Uh, Mr. Willis and I are joined at the hip. He has an amazing team in infrastructure services, and I've got Phil Landry and his team, like we did on Elgin Street. We pushed very uh, hard, and they, that technical team was very innovative in, in making uh, buses a priority through the detours, and we'll continue to do that. Um, I know that you flagged a couple of projects that I passed on to uh, Mr. Gonche and his team. Uh, and Mr. Landry that there's other ones coming down the pipe if RTG is delayed We'll apply that same lens and I, I know that Mr. Willis will look at if they need to postpone or delay some of those or bring a balanced approach to sequencing We'll do that in the interest of not inflicting inflicting any more pain on our uh, transit customers So is our is our perception of inflicting pain only on transit customers or is it all users of roads? including pedestrians cyclists and of course motorists Councillor, you know I'm in charge of all, and it's all, cu all customers of our transportation system. Your question was in the context of customers, but as I've proven over and over again on the Elgin Street detour, it's about all modes of transportation. That's uh, it's the general manager of transportation services. Okay. Thanks very much, Mr. Mayor. But, uh, thank you, Councillor Blake. Councillor Lee. Thank you, uh, Chair. I want to come back, and sorry, I'll ask maybe the uh, counter person to thanks. Um, I want to come back to the uh, to the vehicle availability approach. Uh, I think I heard you said that you are relying on subs uh, who are uh, behind in delivering those vehicles. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Leeper, would you mind repeating that? Um, I, I believe, uh, Mr. Loach, that uh, you are relying on subcontractors uh, in order to be able to deliver the vehicle time for you to make the RSA date. How, what kind of commitments have they um, the subcontractors made to you uh, that gives you the confidence that you're going to meet the RSA date? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's a good question. We meet regularly with the, so when we talk about vehicle subcontractors, we're talking primarily about Alstom, the, the vehicle builder. Um, and the other one is Talus for CBTC, but Talus is, uh, we, we don't have any issues with, with Talus. The commitment we have from Alston, we meet with their executive on a regular basis. We had a, we had a meeting last Friday actually with the North American president of Alston, and they committed to provide additional resources um, at the end of last week, and they did. They brought in additional vehicle technicians from France, from Montreal, to provide us 24-7 coverage. That, coverage, uh, the, 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 these vehicle techs are very important because the city operators are doing a great job. They're running up and down the line um, in the evenings during the days. But every once in a while, a, a small fault will come up and something they're not familiar with, nor is it their responsibility to rectify that. The addition of, a, of, of vehicle techs from, from Alstom, our partner, that will then alleviate some of those delays and that will hopefully alleviate some of the fleet coming off the line and back, back to the NSF for service. Have they given you uh, um, written commitments as to when those vehicles are going to be ready? We have a schedule from Alston which we're tracking, and I think uh, Mr. Manconi talked about, uh, and I think he has the issue as well about, about final acceptance, so we have final acceptance schedules. Um, just on that point, by final acceptance, it's, it's really your, your the, you know, the walk around that the city and RDM, RTM are doing before the dealer hands over the pink slip to us. The vehicles have been running, they've been operating, they've gone through dynamic uh, post-installation checkouts and static post-installation checkouts, they're running. So final acceptance, it, we do have a committed schedule from Alstom, it's very aggressive. We did, ex we did uh, a couple of vehicle acceptances on the weekend and we're doing them well into the evenings and we'll be doing the same thing until they're done. And we have 14 out of 34 accepted vehicles now. And again, I qualify that. These vehicles have all been running, they're assembled, they're not, you know, they're not in a state of repair. We're doing the final walk around and, and agreeing on any, any, outstanding, uh, any outstanding deficiencies. Okay, so, and, uh, and thank you very much for that, uh, for that clarification. I think it is important to understand then, you have written commitments from Alstom that we will have final availability of those trains in time to run your 12-day um, system testing, in time to the March 31st RSA date. Yes, that's correct. Yes, we do. Okay, and I believe you've, uh, you've talked about my next question, which was uh, what, in, uh, what incentive mechanisms and punishment mechanisms you have with Alston uh, in order to encourage them to meet those deadlines? I don't think, uh, Mr. Mayor, I don't think this, this I is think that, that's uh, private and confidential uh, that, uh, between the two companies. Competitive, competitively sensitive? Okay, no, nope. I uh, understood. Yeah. Um, good, no, thank you very much for that, uh, for that precision. Thank you.
you, Councillor Kenny, please. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, just so I'm clear on on the timeline, um, you will be back here, Fedco, in three weeks. But uh, March 19th is actually 12 days out from March 31st. Uh, so that is the the real about uh, are we not I mean, you've got to, if you have a 12 day testing unless you do it sometime in between uh, by March 19th you know if you're going to make that deadline and am I correct in that so backwards from March 31st you are, you are correct that date the 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 drop dead date if you will to start trial running is not of March so that's five weeks from today and that so you still that gives you confidence that five weeks from today you will be at the very least running those trained 12 day tests as i said we're not contemplating any other scenario than the 31st of march and we are closely tracking those eight critical items that we're that mr manconi and i are both aligned on and the next the next few weeks will be quite telling we need to we need to have some success in fleet availability and and vehicles running line consistently so if we just go back to the the slide that showed the um, uh, the elements that are critical to uh, revenue service number seven uh, sign off to be provided on all documents required by the city safety auditor what does that look like is that two or three documents where are we at with those documents like what is is that another 15 points sub points to these eight uh, just uh, just sense of what they what they look like and how far away we are from um, having that sign mr. mayor the uh, the sign-off procedure by, by the safety auditors extremely complex and there's thousands upon thousands of pages of documentation but, but the objective is is we need to give the safety auditor line of sight from design conception all the way through to completion so it's those documents which are compiled which are put together which are presented on on through regular meetings with the safety auditor um, there's hundreds of documents that have to be provided we've whittled that list down to 25 critical documents um, for what we call pri our primary service and the rest about 21 are, are railway related so we're in the process of getting uh, the safety auditor won't approve any of these documents he, he's not going to take on that liability but what he does is he provides a statement of no objection so which means he's comfortable with where we are he agrees with the design pattern and 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 all the steps along the way from design through to testing he agrees with that we've got about half of those complete um, the rest are going to be delivered at the end of this week I believe if I'm not mistaken and, and then we unfortunately we do put a little bit of pressure on on the city and the, and the and the safety auditor to try to churn those through but we're meeting on a regular basis we're not we're not blindsiding anybody with them and uh, the process has been has been robust and quite thorough so if you've whittled it down to 25 and what I'm hearing really is 12, are those last 12 um, easy to meet? Um, are they, will we know by March 5th the next time? Because so our next FedCo is, is March 5th, two weeks after that is the 19th, which is the sort of deadline. Uh, will we know by the 5th how close we are on those safety requirements and having those last, it just seems to me if there are hundreds of documents and we're down to the last handful, uh, they must be pretty critical. Yeah. No, Mr. Mayor, fair, fair question. Um, we're not starting from scratch. The ones that are remaining, um, some, of the, some of the remaining documentation is contingent on getting some uh, some some system results. Um, we talked about tunnel ventilation system, so we need to just inject some of the test results into the documentation. And there's three or four that are attributed to that. That will be complete. So the ones that are remaining, as I said, we're not starting from scratch. It's they're in they've been in internal circulation for review, and then the next step is to issue them formally to the city. But even having said that, there's been several meetings, regular workshops where we're presenting the results, where we're presenting the format, where we're presenting draft copies of these documents. And we'll 
a point in time when those documents, uh, as we get close to the deadline or uh, past this deadline, that they will be uh, public documents? That we'll know what the safety requirements are that we're still waiting for? Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm going to look to Mr. O'Connor uh, in terms of the disclose. I, I uh, want his comment on that. Mr. Mayor, I can't answer that question. I'm not familiar with what the documents actually are. If we got a request under M. Fickle or for members of council or the public asked for us, we would encourage people to use it uh, by an approach of business as usual, and we would be able to make that determination. So just so I'm clear, um, so if we ask for those documents, we might be able to get them? If we have those documents in our possession, then I would make a determination under MFIPA as to whether or not they're to the public. Thank you. So maybe I'll just leave that as, you know, by, by the time we get to March 5th, I think it would be important for us to know if we're still waiting on some of the safety requirements to be signed off, exactly what those are, uh, in addition to the elements that we are still waiting for on the RSA. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The last person I is Councillor Egli for round two. Uh, thank you very much. I guess I started off, so I should, I should finish off. Um, so, so, Mr. Anconi, you, you had indicated a level of skepticism, to say the least, about the March 31st date. So, can you walk us through what happens then? When we were, last time we were trying to fix on a date, there was a whole process. There was negotiation back and forth. So. Assuming you get notice on the 19th that it's or, or before that it's not going to happen, what do we then do? Do we enter into a negotiation stage again with, with RTG to, to fix on another date? Because I know we have to accept the date. So how, how does that process work and what does that add to the timeline of the line eventually opening? Uh, well, it is a, a P3 and it's a public-private partnership. Uh, we're fortunate in that we do have good, frank, open dialogue with our partners. Um, uh, technically speaking, they could keep us waiting right to the last minute. That has not been uh, the case in the past. Uh, so uh, I suspect, I, I'll let Mr. Lausch comment, that if there's early indicators that he doesn't believe he will uh, make March 31st, I know that uh, the city manager and I meet with them on a regular basis, that they would share that opinion with us. They, they understand how sensitive this is to our customers and, and to city council. Um, and uh, so then they would have to give us a new date. I believe it's within 60 days, and it has to be at least a month after. I'm just looking to Mr. Morgan. A month after the original uh, RSA date. The city can deviate from that. We, we hold all the cards in that regard. Uh, I think a good, healthy uh, relationship, uh, which I would describe this one as, as being that, where we agree when we do disagree and uh, um, uh, would do that. But uh, Mr. Lausch is driving the RSA date right now, and theoretically they could wait till the last minute. Again, that hasn't been the past practice. They've had good, open, frank discussion with us. Perhaps Mr. Lausch wants to comment. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think, I think Mr. Manconi articulated it correctly. I mean, we are aligned. We, we have no intention of blindsiding the, uh, the city at the last minute if we decide to change the date. We've had good, frank, open discussions. Um, our executive committee is participating in these discussions. We've made a commitment to the city that if we do feel that there will be a deviation, that we'll give them ample advance notice. So, so we're, we're five or six weeks out, so I'm curious to know what you define as the last minute. Um, you know, there's there's the there's the practical. You can't do it after the 19th because you don't have 12 days. That's that's sort of the practical. But but what realistically you should drop dead date. It can't be the 19th. No, uh, Mr. Mayor, the, the, the drop date is not the 19th. Um, as I, as I mentioned previously, we there's notices that we have to provide to the city. Um, you, you know, I'm not I'm not going to argue the the, the 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 semantics of the of the contract, but I mean wait until the 30th of March to tell you that it's a no-go. We have an obligation to provide advance notice to the city of when we think we will achieve substantial completion. And that is well before the 19th of March. There's, there's 10 days for that, and there's even an advance notice which has to be provided. So there will be, if, again, if, if, there, if there is going to be deviation, and we're not contemplating any, but if there is going to be a deviation, then the advance notice will be several weeks. Okay, I, again, maybe legal can help with this. Do, do we not have a date when we know whether the date is going to be good? 
like, like is, is, there, is there not a drop dead date so the city knows one way or another whether or not our, our March 31st is the date? Not to my knowledge, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, there is, and Mr. Lausch is spot on when he talks about, and there's lots of reviews, the words date. There's the uh, substantial completion date. In other words, all the construction's done. There is a countdown clock that has been activated right now, and there are dates associated with that that he has to provide us notice on leading up to that. So I guess the question is, when does the alarm on that clock go off? When, when does the city know that March 31st is not going to work? Well, um, uh, on February the 12th, uh, today, he's, he's giving us notice that he's continuing on the path of substantial completion. We have another notice coming up in a couple of weeks that it's the next step towards that. So that's why we, we're both saying it's weeks to get to substantial completion if he's still on that track. So within weeks, we'll know. Anything else, Councillor? Well, well, I'm still not sure if I can uh, answer. I can just offer a comment, Councillor Aguilar. Uh, our history of giving a specific date hasn't been great around here, so uh, I don't I'm disagree, quite comfortable Mr. Mayor. with a range of uh, dates, and uh, I think that makes much more sense. We have a firm, firm date of the 31st. We've been assured by the uh, company, the consortium, they're going to meet that. There's obviously some skepticism about whether that date will be met or not, and then there are other dates that uh, contractually they're obliged to inform us. And I think it's in our best interest to say it's, it's within the next uh, several weeks. And uh, the minute we have information, uh, my undertaking and direction to staff is that we share that with the public and council. So just for clarification, so we could know before the next Fed code meeting that's, that's going on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you both, uh, all three very much. Appreciate it. Item two, uh, Councillor McKenney, you want to... Uh, sorry. Councillor McKenney, did you have a question on the mandate of FEDCO? Yeah. Uh, Do you want to take a seat? Something you said, everybody's reading. Yeah, um, I think the. Anyways, go ahead. What's uh, the issue? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I've given the solicitor and clerk, city clerk a heads up. So Wait, can you speak a little louder? So yes, um, just looking at the terms of um, terms of reference for this committee, and uh, number twenty four in particular, um, that this committee now is responsible for the review of all issues relating to elected representatives. Um, is this? I just wonder. Is this the only change in the terms of reference, and is this a, as a result of uh, members Services Committee being uh, enveloped into this committee? Yes and yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And so if I just go down to Part C, and I have to uh, confess to not uh, having ever read the Member Services Committee Terms of Reference before. I don't so. think it ever met last term. I don't think it ever did. No, it existed, really. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Entitlement of councillors to city facilities and resources for the performance of their duties. Can you just tell me what exactly that means and, and maybe a, an example? And I'll tell you, the reason I'm asking is, um, I mean, I'm sure we all um, struggle to find meeting space, but my meeting space is usually here at City Hall. I don't have a, a larger kind of community center plant pool you can rent but it takes about two and a half years out to get a to get a room so I just wonder what in practical terms that means mr. mayor it does include uh, rooms at City Hall but I'm advised by the general manager of uh, recreation cultural and facilities services that it would include a lot of the parks and rec buildings community says uh, spots and then he's got a whole uh, program by which he uh, lends those out to various people including members of council so just so that just means that if there's a change in how we allocate uh, rooms to councillors, uh, that that comes back to this committee. Is that correct? Uh, certainly, if there was a dispute about it or was changing his policy, I would recommend it come back here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That was everything. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on that? Carried. Uh, notice is a motion for consideration of subsequent meeting. Inquiries, any written inquiries? Other business? Adjournment? Motion to adjourn? Carried. Carried. Thank you all very much. Meeting adjourned. Next meeting is uh, March 5th.
And a reminder that the council will not be held uh, tomorrow. Those items will be carried over to the following meeting. And uh, stay safe. Adjourn.